Okay, let's begin. Uh, let me start thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here and to uh, stay for a some time in Florence, which I enjoy very much. Um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about um, a topic which is hopefully well related to the to the focus week as well as the the, the whole uh, uh, workshop, which is ads 3 cft 2 in the context of F-theory. And this is the first part of the talk will be a bit more review, as we will see, and the new part is going to be based on work to appear, so it's not there is not yet a paper on the archive with these people. Uh, the first one is uh, my, my current PhD student, uh, and this is the student of uh, Sakura, and uh, I suppose you know the other, the other names. So that's the plan. Uh, um, I will start with some background and motivations to set, uh, set up the, uh, the discussion, reviewing some frameworks for holography, and then contrasting the, the differences which uh, we have uh, to face to begin with in holographies versus F-theory. Then I will review some of the ADS-3 holography, maybe this is a very uh, ambitious plan, and this is the uh, main part, uh, of the new part. So roughly speaking, despite the, this, uh, these points, the division is uh, in two parts. The first part is light and entertaining, and the second part is uh, technical. So you can decide which one you want to follow. Um, right. So the, the light part, so the background the motivations. So since the formulation of the, the ads cft correspondence, searching for anti deceptor solutions in some dimensions has been used as an approach to explore conformal field theories. Um, now, of course, in principle, one can use that without supersymmetry, but um, often th the power of supersymmetry helps, uh, and we like symmetry, as it was mentioned this morning. So I will assume this from the rest of the from now on in the rest of the talk. So I will be interested in anti deceptor supersymmetric solutions and their field theory duals. Now, since we knew a lot about conformal field theories in two dimensions uh, when the ads cfd correspondence was formulated and much less in dimension higher than two the attention has been for a long time devoted to four or three dimensions and more recently actually there have been developments in higher dimensions in five and six um, on the other hand also occasionally in many in many instances which i will review in the in the course of the discussion also d equal one and d equal two have been considered in particular <laughs> the interest for ads2 and ads3 arises because they they pop up as near horizon limits of various black holes or black strings in four and five dimensions and counting of the microstates of the uh, relative uh, of the dual conformal field theories provide provides a window into the microscopic origin <coughs> of the entropy of these black holes for example, in some cases, we can compute exactly uh, these, uh, these entropies microscopically by using some indices or performing localization techniques, for example. ads 3 holography is also interesting per se. There are many connections with other topics, integrability, higher spin, quantum gravity, as we have seen this morning, condensed matter. Uh, so there are, of course, um, other titles uh, related to this. And also, perhaps, two-dimensional conformal field theories are, after all, a richer subject than it was expected initially, as we can construct various exotic uh, theories from various wrapped brains. Um, and recently, there have been some developments uh, related to the technique of C-extremization for determining the central charges, uh, and so on. So I will talk about all of this in the first part of the talk. Okay, so which framework uh, am I interested in for studying holography? I will advocate the top-down approach. So we are interested in, in studying holography, then we need to find solutions, more or less explicit, of supergravity theories in 10 or 11 dimensions. So this is referred as top-down approach, uh, which is opposed as a bottom-up, where what there is more freedom to solve some uh, particular toy model that might capture some features that one is interested in. So this research, this, this has motivated some research in the last 12 or 13 years or so, 
for scanning systematically through the supersymmetric solutions with uh, an anti deceptor factor, and in general a warp factor, uh, in 10 or 11 dimensions. So uh, uh, a program which uh, I have contributed with some initial uh, work, as I will uh, show in a second, and then many other people have, uh, have contributed. So this is a partial list of representative references. Um, some of the few of the first ones, which uh, with my collaborators at Imperial we worked on, that was <laughs> the focus was in, in five-dimensional anti-deceptor. Uh, these are uh, order in chronological order, so that's the, the order. There is no other uh, ordering principle. Um, and there, are, there was a work, which I will uh, actually reprise later by Kim, that classified anti deceptor tree solutions, and that's very relevant for, the, for this talk, uh, with some simplification, so this is not a general analysis. And then later, ADS4, ADS7, ADS6, ADS5. Right. So as I said, there are also other partial results. Now, what about if we're interested in studying anti deceptor solutions in the presence of D7 brains? So in type 2b supergravity, <laughs> we have uh, D3 brains uh, related to the F5 flux, uh, and then D1, D5, and, and uh, NS5, uh, and uh, strings. And of course, we have also in principle D7 brains. Now, although the tau, the axiodilaton, has been included in uh, some or, or most of the uh, previous references which I mentioned before, actually there are no, I should say, no examples, or at least very, very few examples, where uh, the solutions comprise a non-trivial dilaton, and, this and uh, uh, the solution is either non-singular, or even if it's singular, then there is some nice interpretation. So yeah, it, it, it's, it, it gives rise to something exotic, which is the reason why perhaps it hasn't been studied much in the past. But in very recently, people have actually studied these configurations from the field theory point of view. So there are field theories wi where uh, with, with, not with uh, varying space-time varying coupling. They can be op obtained, for example, from reduction from six dimensions and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you think of the coupling as uh, as uh, uh, as depending on this of the energy. And therefore, you think that if it's firing, then it's not a fixed point. What I'm saying is that you can have situations where the coupling is varying on space-time, but it's it's not varying in terms of uh, RG scale. No, I mean the the space. Uh, um, well, yeah, the compact space. Yes, I presume so. Although I'm not I'm quite familiar with that, but uh, yeah. Okay, so here uh, I have my. Uh, okay, so I, I should uh, I should update my my transparencies and my my references and so on, uh, and maybe you can actually later point out. Yes, um, I don't know how how generic this phenomenon is. Uh, anyway. It would be interesting to extend this more, let's say, let, let, let's put it this way. Uh, now, what we expect in general is in the presence of these seven brains that there will be singularities. So that's an expected behavior. So um, I think it would be too, it's too restrictive to expect to find solutions with seven brains and uh, with varying coupling and no singularities at all. And that's related to this comment here. Uh, as well as was uh, perhaps first, firstly explored and pointed out by the, by this paper by Green et al. Indeed, um, type two B with a non-trivial tau uh, is a possible definition uh, of uh, of F theory. So the question is whether we can incorporate in some meaningful way 
holography in the context of, of F-theory, um, I guess Costas would tell me yes, because there are many examples. And uh, <laughs> so I will study those examples to see what's known, but uh, um, it's, still a it's still a valid question to, to understand better. And, and here are, uh, again, to, to, to um, show why these two words in principle are, um, are separated. So if we do holography in the very conservative sense, we have some ADS space warped, uh, the CFT lives on the boundary, and then we have some smooth in, uh, compact manifold, um, and the metric generically takes this, this form here. Um, with all the flexes um, generic and say in, in many cases tau is constant. On the other hand, uh, the typical situation in, uh, that is uh, studied by the F-theory people is uh, that they have some 10-dimensional space which is uh, a product and then there is a base and a non-trivial tau and then one can write down this sort of ansatz for a 12-dimensional for a metric where x and y are not really sort of physical coordinates, but are some coordinates in some auxiliary uh, space. Of course, uh, we all know that there is no 12-dimensional supergravity, so we cannot think in terms of 12-dimensional supergravity, but still there have been many, many uh, uh, arguments for saying that it's a useful point of view to think of, uh, of this uh, auxiliary space and, and, and together, uh, in, in some situations, this forms uh, a Calabiao uh, manifold. So this can be a Calabiao threefold or a twofold, fourfold, and many cases have been discussed in the literature. So that's the picture. Uh, there is a non-trivial vibration of, uh, of this torus, and tau is the complex structure of, of the torus, and this degenerates uh, at various singular points. Right? So that's the typical situation of F-theory. So, okay, so there are two contrasting things. So the person interested in holography, uh, let's call him holographer, likes smooth non-singular spaces and preferably uses explicit metrics and checks the killing spinners if we're interested in supergravity and so on. Whereas the person interested in F-theory is perfectly fine in a world with singularities, doesn't need any metric, doesn't want even to talk about the metrics, I should say, <laughs> um, and is sort of a bit uh, upset if he's forced or her, she is forced to talk about metrics. But, uh, um, and then on the other hand, uh, they can use algebraic geometry in a, in a very pow powerful way, right? So there seems to be two different communities, and the question is that we're trying to strike a deal here, right? So there is the ADS-CFT guy, there is the F-theory guy. Well, my collaborator has already complained, why did you put two guys? I mean, why not? <laughs> I didn't find the appropriate picture. So, okay, nice, deal. Or, is this the situation? Like, hmm, right, can, let's see, maybe yes. Right, so after these uh, uh, initial uh, uh, introductions, um, I will now start to talk about some something that you know very well, some cases of ADS-3 holography and sort of building up and generalizing uh, this. So let me go quickly through the ADS-3 holography with D5, D1 system, because these are older than me, they're very w w well, well studied. Um, the classic, the the most classic example is ADS3 cross S3 cross T4, for example, in, in, in type 2b, uh, which arises from the near hori uh, horizon limit of multiple D1 and D5 brains. And then this featured in the paper by, you know, original paper by Mal Maldacena, where uh, there is such a sentence that this should be dual to a 4,4 superconformal field theory. So there are Q1 D5, D1 brain, Q5 D5, and that's the situation that the ones are just along the, uh, the D5. The near horizon limit is ADS3 cross S3. Uh, and um, the fact that there is a 4,4 and there is an SU2R inside the SO4 means actually that this is a small superconformal algebra. 
um, we can do perfectly well holography in this case. In fact, well, the, we can compute the holographic central charge by using the brown henoff formula that involves the radius of ADS3 and the uh, uh, mm, Newton constant in, in three dimensions, which, let's keep it in mind for the future, is proportional to the volume of the internal manifold. And then uh, there is this standard result uh, for the central charge. A slightly more complicated situation, but of a similar spirit, was studied by many people. And I wasn't, uh, again, I wasn't quite able to find the original reference. This is one of the early references in the late 90s that studied this problem of ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1. So that's the picture, that's the brain picture, <laughs> and uh, the two-dimensional field theory is supposed to live on this common intersection along these directions. Again, this preserves the same supersymmetry as the previous case, 4,4. However, the presence of the two S3s means that there is a larger isometry group, is SO4 cross SO4, and both of them contain an SU2 right, under which the spinors transform, and this is the case of a large superconformal algebra. Uh, and actually, relatively recently, it was Dave Tong who uh, uh, proposed uh, a field theory uh, um, realization of this system uh, and managed to reproduce microscopically the holographic central charge, which can be computed again, as before, from the brown henoff formula, uh, by using uh, as basically uh, the idea of ex uh, C-extremization, which I will talk about later, so let me not go into this here. Uh, the next step, we're getting closer to what uh, sort of the work that we have been doing with the micro laborators, is to uh, think about ADS3 as arising from uh, the D3 brains instead of the 1, D5 brains. So I think everyone in the audience have heard that you can get ADS3 from the 1, D5. Perhaps a bit less people have heard that you can get it also from, from D3 brains. And the way to do that is you take uh, your bunch, uh, your stack of D3 brains, and you wrap them uh, two of the, the, the directions on a, on a compact surface, uh, sigma, inside some uh, whatever uh, transverse eight-dimensional non-compact manifold. So this gives rise to effective strings on the R1,1 1, 1, 1, uh, word volume. And by choosing appropriately the embedding manifold and the cycle inside it, various fractions of supersymmetry can be preserved. So this gives rise, by, def by definition almost, to a, a supersymmetric field theory in, in two dimensions, or a sigma model, or call it whatever you want. Something which doesn't have gravity, and it lives in two dimensions, and has supersymmetry. The, f the, the simplest example for is to think about um, for example, um, n equal four, and again, wrap on a, on a sigma, and you get some, some effective theory in two dimensions. And then the question is, is this two-dimensional field theory conformal in the infrared? Th that's in general not a very simple question, um, but there is a simple answer. If uh, one can find a, an ADS3 background, uh, namely a solution which comprises an ADS3 factor, which can be thought of as the near horizon of, of this brain configuration, exactly uh, as in the previous examples, but now we have in mind this D3 brain configuration. Right? So if we can find these solutions, then we can claim that we, there is uh, a, a dual um, ADS3 dual to this field theory, which flows to a conformal field theory, and then we can, in principle, ask various questions. The, the typical questions to ask would be to, for example, match the central charges on the two sides. That's the simplest, although in, in many cases it's, it's non-trivial, but that's the simplest question one can ask. Then, of course, one could ask about matching of BPS spectrum, and et cetera, et cetera, that at the later stage. So if we take this point of view, then one can um, go back to supergravity and uh, sort of uh, very, uh, by brute force, uh, um, address all the possible ADS3 solution that one can construct arising from the three brains. Right? So if we have the complete answer, then whatever construction we will come up with, it, we must find the solution in, in these equations. And so that was this work of Kim, which I'm going to describe. And uh, so in fact, when I talk, when I talk about the supergravity um, construction, 
um, the, the only details which I'll present are regarding this case. The case that uh, I will uh, be, uh, we are working on is a, is a bit more general than that, but uh, it doesn't matter. So um, that, that is perfectly good enough for uh, showing the, the logic. So uh, as in all this list of references, which, which I've shown to you at the beginning, uh, is, is a bit algorithmic, not completely, but almost algorithmic procedure. Uh, you input something, and the input is a, is a very general ansatz for the metric and for the fluxes, and then you plug them into the supersymmetry equations, and then there are some techniques, which some of you are, are very uh, familiar with, to, uh, to find the most general solution of these equations. Right? So here, the work required at least 0, 0,2 supersymmetry. Uh, if you require 0, 0,1, you would get something more general but uh, it doesn't really matter. What we are interested in is 0, 0,2. Um, this is the case where you have an R symmetry. This is the case where you can do C extremization on the field theory side, so that's the, the interesting case. Uh, it's a bit like uh, N equal 2 in three dimensions, so you're, you're not interested in N equal, well, it's is, is more powerful to think about N equal 2 than to N equal 1. Right, the output of the analysis after uh, some several pages of calculations, is that you get the most general form of the metric on this seven-dimensional uh, unspecified manifold. And, and this turns out to be uh, uh, a vibration with some warp factor on, on a base which is scalar. So it's equipped with a, with a two-form, the scalar form, and has a richer form related to this row uh, one form that appears in the metric. So that's the structure, is a U1 bundle over, over this scalar manifold, and uh, this isometry corresponding to uh, d by d psi killing vector corresponds to the asymmetry of the dual uh, conformal field theory. So for those of you who have seen similar things in the context of, uh, uh, say, five-dimensional sasaki einstein manifold, this is very similar, although, although it's a bit more complicated, actually. Also, one gets uh, the explicit form of the flux, the five-form flux, which is encoded uh, uh, in a, in a two-form here, right? So all of this seems very nice, and it, it looks like you're going to sit down and find uh, auxillions of solutions. Although actually there is a very non-trivial solution uh, equation to solve. So uh, that's uh, that's the price one has to pay in this case. Uh, there's always a price in these games that, uh, that you at some point you strike some non-trivial equations to solve. So here the non-trivial equation at least can be written in, in, in a small space. And it involves uh, the Ricci scalar of this compact manifold uh, and uh, also uh, the square of it and uh, the contraction of the Ricci tensor. So, yes? I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usual supergravity. It's just a sort of integrability condition that you get for consistency of the supersymmetry equations. There is no guarantee. I mean, <laughs> you get, you can get equations which are up to sixth order. I've, there are examples I can show you. Sorry? No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm just solving supersymmetry, and supersymmetry implies that these equations must be solved. Uh, you can think of this as an integrability equation, so it's uh, it's Im it's implied by supersymmetry. I mean, super look, supersymmetry tells you that there are many equations to solve, which are first order. But you shouldn't expect that your final equations are are a single first order. Yeah, you can say in this way, but yeah, I mean, the, the <laughs> basically that's the only equation that in this case that's the only equation that remains to be solved. Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you write this, that's first order. Uh, so basically, I'm telling you that this is equivalent to this, roughly speaking. So if you if you pick a Keller a Keller space, uh, you, well, you cannot just pick whatever you want. You have to pick a magic that solves this equation here. Right. Okay. So that's <laughs> that's the work of Kim. How much time do I have? 15 minutes. Um, 
Good question. Um, I, don't, I don't remember top of my head. Probably not. It, it, it I can't remember. Um, yeah, there is a warp factor, and, and typically the warp factor is related to the dilaton, but um, not not this, the done o not always are just identical. So there is there might be a relation to the dilaton. Uh, but well, the fact I've not written suggests that the dilaton is not involved. But uh, okay, yeah, I might have just missed it. I should speed up a bit because uh, otherwise I won't have time, uh, since there were a few questions. Um, the next example, which I'm going to go through quick, I mean, the example of a solution to those equations was provided by Benini and Bobev, and uh, they constructed uh, on one hand. The, uh, uh, some supergravity solutions that solve uh, this nasty equation here. Uh, they did it in a different way, incidentally, but still uh, they must solve this equation. And on the other hand, they constructed the, the field theory dual, so the two-dimensional field theory dual. And this is following exactly the logic I was telling you before. They have some eight-dimensional Calabi-Yau uh, fourfold, which is a, uh, which is a um, uh, sum of line bundles over over Riemann surface, and then they can do uh, they can implement some twisting on the original uh, n equal four theory in order to preserve supersymmetry. And uh, and if the twisting is is you know, implemented in the right way, one preserves zero comma two. Moreover, they can also uh, by using the well, the method that they proposed, namely C extremization, they can determine exactly the central charges CR and C left, which happens to be uh, equal in this case, and they're proportional to N square and these twisting parameters here. So some of the interesting point, which uh, will be important later, is that uh, actually for 0, 0,2 theories, the central charge CR in this convention is proportional to this uh, uh, coefficient K, which appears in the in the anomaly equation for the non-conservation of the R symmetry current, whereas the difference CR minus C left is encoded into the gravitational anomaly. So let me then skip uh, the rest, uh, uh, just saying that this matches exactly the holographic computation by using the Brown and no formula. There are some generalizations, but I'll skip. So let's come to, to the to the work that we have. Otherwise, I won't uh, I won't say much about it. So uh, the plan is to have uh, perhaps a couple of papers. Uh, the idea is to characterize uh, supersymmetric solutions of, of F theory, so therefore generalizing the work of Kim and then find solutions, therefore generalizing, for example, the work of uh, Benini et al. Right? And understand their field theory duals. So let me describe the gravity part. So again, we, have, uh, we can input uh, a, a similar ansatz, uh, but then we allow for arbitrary uh, tau. Now, in principle, one can allow for a uh, non-trivial uh, three-form flux, uh, and this is something that we started, we, one, one, one can pursue that, but it's, it's quite tedious and complicated. Um, so uh, if one is interested in, in uh, sort of capturing some features of F theory, it's of course enough for, to begin with to focus on having a, a non-trivial uh, tau. Right? So we again uh, do the machinery, and uh, the upshot is that M6, as before, is still a Kähler space, uh, and a way to uh, formulate, the there are various ways to formulate the, the results. One way, which is sort of uh, uh, cute, is in terms of this F theory metric, which is constructed, as I mentioned before, by using the typical ansatz that F theory people use. So we, we add two extra coordinates, X and Y, and then uh, normally the F theory uh, people would say this is a Calabi-Yau fourfold, in our case, that's not a Calabi-Yau fourfold. It's uh, actually it's some nasty Kähler space, which obeys, again, the same equations as before, but in two dimension higher. So that's one of the outputs of the, of the analysis. Um, if you require more supersymmetry, uh, then uh, actually you can refine the analysis and get some extra constraints. So this is exactly what we have done. And so we can impose, for example, to have 2, 2 uh, instead of just 2, 0 or uh, 0, 0,4, uh, 
or higher if you want, but this is already very constraining. And in fact, uh, for the rest of the talk, I will focus on, on exactly on this case of 0 0,4, where there are some um, interesting uh, uh, lessons uh, to learn. So <coughs> if one does that, uh, uh, it implies, after uh, some uh, quick computations, that uh, the warp factor is constant, and the eight-dimensional manifold, which should obey this uh, complicated equation, actually boils down to uh, this product form, is an S2 times uh, now really a uh, Calabiao, um, which is exactly of the type studied in F-theory. So this is an elliptic, elliptically fibered Calabiao. So the structure of the of the solution is this one. So you have ADS3 cross S3. This S3 arises from the uh, hop vibration over the S2. So there was an S2 over M8, but this becomes an S3. Uh, and then you get uh, this Calabiao here together. This is the elliptic vibration on a base. So this is denoted Y, and that's our elliptic uh, Calabiao. Right? So that's. That's the solution, and if you if you forget this and you think about type 2b, this is the solution. ADS3 crosses 3 times some some base, which has to be Kähler. Actually, there is a, a, a little bit extra uh, structure and subtlety. If one looks at the killing spinners uh, explicitly, so one needs really to check the the spinorial derivatives, for example, of, of the explicit killing spinners. One can find out that. Uh, they transform, so the four um, killing spinners transform as both uh, in the SU2R subgroup of SO4. So despite the fact that there is an S3, that's similar to the D1, D5 cases that I've discussed. Uh, actually, only an SU2R is a R symmetry, whereas the other factor of SU2L uh, plays the role of a flavor, uh, flavor symmetry of the theory. So again, we, this establishes that there is a, a small superconformal algebra. And moreover, uh, it shows that one can take a quotient. If this uh, quotient um, is inside SU2L, and that preserves supersymmetry. Right? So actually, the upshot is that the most general 0, 0,4 solution in this case is ADS3 cross S3 qu uh, uh, quotiented, so the land space, times this B4. And uh, the five form flux is, is fixed in terms of a Kähler form of this base, which I will denote J4 for the moment. Let me try to get to one of the uh, points I want to, s want to make. So we can compute the holographic central charge by using the usual formula, which I've mentioned already a few times. Uh, and if you just uh, do the computation, and you have to basically compute the volume of S3 times B4. Right? So so you have the volume of S3 here and the volume of B4. Uh, the, the denominator arises from the careful uh, quantization of the fluxes, as usual, and so on. So the, the upshot is that one gets this expression is proportional to n squared m and this volume. n is an integer that arises from the quantization of F5. So this is uh, interpreted as the number of the three brains. Uh, and we'll talk about m perhaps uh, in a few minutes. So <coughs> this gives the leading order central charge, uh, which is computed holographically, although the sub uh, co there could be subleading corrections, which actually there are, and we can also compute those, but uh, definitely I, will have, I don't have any time to talk about that, and I decided to not talk about that. Uh, the point I want to make here is that actually, and this is a delicate point that one has to think about for, for a while, the metric on the B4 is singular. So this is often something that, again, people talking about F theory don't, don't, don't think about very, very much. Um, but uh, one can check explicitly from, from the equations. One can see in various ways that the metric is singular. I mean, this is related to the fact that tau is singular, has this log behavior. So uh, tau uh, is related to the, to the, to the, to the Ricci tensor of, uh, of the metric on before. The metric must be singular. There is no nothing to, uh, d and in fact, there are mathematical papers where, where they show that um, more or less explicitly for K3s and so on. So what do we mean, what do we mean by volume of B4? Uh, and this is a point uh, of uh, a place where actually the, the whole thing could break apart. And, and uh, so 
maybe there is no deal and everyone goes back to their own uh, uh, works. So let's instead insist in trying to make sense of it. So the idea is that uh, one can view this uh, trivially as uh, um, the integral of this uh, uh, from here. Uh, and then recall that from the F-theory point of view, this is before is the base of an elliptically fibered uh, Calabi-Yau. And from an algebraic point of view, so from the F-theory point of view, uh, people, uh, this variety here is, is perfectly smooth as an algebraic variety. It, ha it has vanished in first-gen class, and therefore uh, there must exist a, a non-singular rich flat metric. So somehow the, uh, the, the, the friction comes from the fact that the ansatz that one puts in with this particular vibration for the, for the torus uh, is not able to capture the, the fact that there exists a metric which is non-singular. So it's an oversimplified ansatz, I would say. However, one, one knows by general results that such a metric would exist and there would be a non-singular Keller form, which uh, here in this talk I denote uh, uh, in this way, there is a part which is again on the, on the base, which is smooth, and then there is a part which is uh, on, on, the, on the T2 fiber. Right. So uh, this is, uh, one can expand this on a, on a base of two forms of, uh, of, uh, of the Keller space before, uh, and this omega zero, as I said, is a, a Poincare dual to the, to the base itself. So given this fact, one can compute in, a, uh, in this auxiliary resolved space the volume, this volume, by, uh, by uh, as an integral over the uh, full result Calabi-Yau space, just by inserting this, uh, which gives by definition the, uh, as the Poincare dual of the base, so this gives the de by definition this expression, which uh, again by Poincare duality can be written as the self-intersection of the cur curve dual to, to J. Right? So in the resolved space, this is a well-defined computation and one can do that. And <laughs> we uh, take the point of view that actually in the singular limit, this J4 smooth goes to the singular one, but the result of the computation is a, is a, compu is a, is a topological number, so it's robust. Uh, and so indirectly one can, one can infer that uh, the result would stay the same if one was able, if one actually had the metric and was able to compute it, uh, it would get uh, a non-singular result, uh, which is this one. So it, it includes the self-intersection of the curve. So now that once that we have this result, we would like to compare this to, uh, um, to some um, microscopic computation and also the subleading corrections that in fact we can compute. So there are two routes. I will just mention that and then I will check my time. <laughs> one, one route is to think about again uh, type 2b and the other route is to uh, perform a duality and go to M theory and then think about uh, M5 brain there. How much time do I have? 2, 3, comma, 4, comma, 5. Good. Um, so I definitely need to make a choice about topics to discuss. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I'll carry on. Basically, I'll, uh, I'll carry on, and uh, I think that basically I will skip the, the M theory, the M theory picture, uh, completely because of lack of time. Right. First of all, uh, a few comments about the uh, the in physical interpretation of M. So one can view this M as uh, um, arising from uh, this quotient, as arising from the near horizon limit of a Taubnat uh, metric. So namely, you can think of this space here, uh, where this is a Taubnat metric uh, with, a, um, with this parameter m, and put the brains uh, as before along R R11 uh, and inside a curve C in B4, as I show here, and that would be the near horizon limit. So as, as we know, this metric here represents uh, M Kaluza Klein monopoles. So the full solution can be taught as the near horizon limit of N D3 brains plus M Kaluza Klein monopoles. Right. So in this case, this would be uh, a bit complicated. Maybe there is a way to do that, but so far we haven't really thought about Kaluza Klein monopoles much. Uh, but one can do, one can go to the M theory picture by doing some some steps which I will not actually describe today because of the lack of time. Um, 
and then use uh, the microscopic description in terms of anomaly inflow and fibrains to, to compute microscopically the central charges in this case. However, the uh, case M equal 1 is special because actually you don't need any, any monopole in this case. Uh, you can just put your brains transverse to R4 and the, in the near horizon limit they would give exactly the same geometry. Right. So there are, you can think of two uh, UV completions of this, of this solution for the case M equal 1. One has a one calusa klein monopole and the other one has nothing, has just a transverse uh, flat space. So in this case, if we take this, uh, this point of view where, where there is no calusa klein monopole, then we can use some microscopic description that is provided on the market. So in this case, we have uh, and the three brains which wrap the curve C into B4, and uh, these uh, are known as uh, um, self-dual strings. So here I call them D3 strings uh, because they, they are D3 wrapped, which are behave as strings. And actually in this relatively recent paper by uh, Tachikawa and Sh Shimizu, by using a, a 6D point of view, uh, again, coming from F-theory, uh, reducing on a, on a four-dimensional manifold and having an effective six-dimensional theory, uh, then they have these strings and they have uh, computed the anomaly polynomial of these strings. Right? So these anomaly polynomials are nowadays very much uh, uh, in, in, in use uh, in, in various places. They're very powerful because uh, they capture the information about anomalies of a theories, even though you don't know the microscopic description in terms of Lagrangian or anything like that. So uh, in order to implement this computation, one has to first of all realize what's the global symmetry of the theory. So there is some <coughs> SO, uh, SO4 transverse rotation to the, to the string. And then there is an SU2i, uh, which is the R symmetry of the effective uh, six-dimensional theory. And uh, well, the result of this, computer of this paper here is that the anomaly polynomial can be written in terms of uh, these C2, which are the second chain classes of the various, uh, of the various uh, uh, bundles here. And P1 is the first point dragging class of the, of the tangent bundle of the, of the space. And then the coefficient in front of these various uh, um, forms uh, gave rise to, 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 to these uh, uh, levels. So one can extract these levels from, from this expression here, right? One can also extract CL minus CR, but I have not, I have not written. So, uh, so we have this KR and KL. So in this way, we can actually extract uh, um, CR by, by taking this uh, expression here for KR. Uh, and of course, um, it will match uh, in agreement with the holographic computation. Actually, the agreement that we get is also subleading orders, uh, including order n equal one, uh, which it was uh, computed in, uh, explicitly in this paper by some of my collaborators. Right. So, so we can get some uh, agreement uh, in this in this way. Now, uh, here we come to these empty reduals, uh, but uh, I don't want to go much over time. So uh, let me just say that uh, one could do this M-theory dualities, uh, but one has to do it very carefully uh, because you have an explicit supergravity solution. So you can't just say, oh yes, I do this T-duality from the D3 brain, I get M5 brain, uh, and that's it. You actually have to sit down, compute, check that the killing spinners are preserved, uh, and there is no cheating, okay? So if you do that without cheating, you find some interesting features and some, some surprises and some uh, uh, subtleties. That's, uh, that, that's the only thing I get to say uh, because I was too slow in the first part of the talk, so I will, uh, I will conclude. So we started to explore systematically holographic constructions in the context of F-theory, focusing on ADS3 uh, CFT2, and we have characterized the general local solution preserving various fraction of supersymmetry. One thing that one can do uh, in, the, in the future is to turn on this tree from Flux, Ramon Ramon and Neville Schwartz. Uh, but, and that would, then you would have the full, uh, the full list of Fluxes. We have the technology to do that. Uh, it's just going to be extremely tedious. So uh, someone very energetic should actually do that. Um, in the case of 0, 0,4, which we have, mm, we have focused and which I've talk about a bit uh, today, we have some microscopic understanding of the holographic construction. 
in terms of uh, uh, basically um, uh, anomaly inflow, either from the D3 brain point of view, which I've discussed briefly, and also from the M5 point of view, which I have not discussed, unfortunately, uh, and that also had various, uh, various uh, subtleties. So I'd be happy to talk about that uh, privately if anyone is interested. Uh, one thing that we can do next is to focus on the perhaps even more interesting part, which is the 0, 0,2 case where we can actually already construct various uh, examples generalizing the construction of Benini et al. And we are in the process of understanding the field theory duals, uh, which is uh, quite um, challenging. I mean, this case was full of uh, uh, um, caveats, and, and this is going to be even fuller. So um, hopefully in the, in the near future, we will conclude also the analysis of the 0, 0,2 examples. Uh, but for the moment, uh, I think you, if you're interested in, you should look out for the case 0, 0,4 to come out soon. Thank you, and sorry for the overtime. Uh, dual to the large superconformal, 0, 0,4 is enhanced to 4,4 4 in the infrared, or he hopes it is. Yes. Do you see any signal for this in your analysis? Um, the supersymmetry of the, in the infrared is read off directly from the solution, right? So that's... Uh, Um, top of my head, I've not thought about this supersymmetry preserved in the UV, so I wouldn't be able to make a, uh, an informed statement about the amount of supersymmetry which is preserved by these brain configurations uh, in the UV. Um, it might, it might, it's a typical case. I mean, it happens all the time that when you have a brain system, uh, as you go in the in the UV, uh, there is some enhancement of. Uh, Sorry, in the in the IAR. Sorry, sorry. In the, I mean, in the IAR. I mean, take just the D3 brain flat space. That's the most stupid example, uh, and I think this is quite generic. Uh, so the UV theory actually has less supersymmetry than the infrared. But in my case, uh, again, I, I don't know exactly what. Yeah, I don't know. Top. Yeah. Yeah, I'm discuss everything I'm discussed here basically was uh, uh was uh for the ADS the dual uh, the, the fixed point. Yes. Yes. Uh, but you could ask me the question what is the 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 supersymmetry preserved by the D3 brains wrapped uh, etc. And I think I I it would be uh more but uh, I have I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> 